I'm very thrilled to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Shai Pradi. We'll be talking about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, I've known Shai for many, quite a few years since before the pandemic. I, when I toured his center in Tel Aviv, which is this extraordinary facility and with a NASA-like control room. This is not just like your little chamber in a room. Uh, this is an extraordinary um, device that, that he has there and then expanded to, to Dubai and to Orlando, Florida. We're trying to work on ones in other cities in the US, and including New York. It's a, it's, a, it's a large facility, but we don't need to go into the logistics of that. It's more into what he, what his work is in the last couple of decades. He's been working on hyperbaric. This is like no other hyperbaric treatment. You see all the, a lot of places doing it and centers in the US, but this is a whole nother level of really healing. This is actually allowing the body to self-heal in, in the most um, extraordinary way. So he's going to go through the conditions, long haul COVID, PTSD, age related memory decline, um, post stroke, so, so many things that actually hyperbaric have done the right way, uh, really is an extraordinary powerful regenerative uh, system. So Dr. Friday, who's a professor at the Segal Medical School and a researcher, he's published hundreds of articles. There's a great website that the Aviv Clinic has where you can see the research from um, through hyperbarics and right now I'll stop talking and I'll just let you experience the real thing. So my good friend and colleague, Dr. Shia Friday. I would love that. <laughs> okay. So I'm happy to be here, and thank you, Woody, very much. Very, here's Woody. This is my first time in such a conference, and at least the first presentation was amazing. I hope you will enjoy what I'm going to say. So what we're going to speak, we are going to speak on what we call the hyperoxic epoxic paradox. Okay, and don't be afraid of that. Many of you call it hyperbaric, but the hyperbaric chamber is just a tool. What we are really dealing with is performance. And our goal as physician is to enhance the performance of our friends, our clients, our patients. And when we are dealing with performance, performance is actually the net effect between degenerative process things that takes us down, to regenerative process, things that takes us up. And if you will take this car, from the moment this car is out of the factory, usually there is a degenerative process that happened to the car. And from time to time, we need, we need to fix it. The same hold to that vehicle that speak with you now, okay? The same thing. If we will take this car, in general, general, in our world, we have two options. is whether we are managing our health or whether we are managing our disease. If you are a car racer in Formula One, you will not wait until you have an accident. You will make a stop at the pit stop. Okay? Why, why you make a stop at the pit stop? You know that you can take another round. But you make the stop at the pit stop because you know that if you will not do that, the cost of non-stopping will be significantly higher than the cost of stopping. So what will be the optimal pit stop for this, this human body? In the pit stop that we will have, if we will have a wishful thinking, what will we need? We need, we need a trigger that will start the regenerative process. We will need repairs, and this is, this is the stem cells. In a minute, we will get to that. We will need energy, and for energy we will have to have oxygen, and we will have to improve our mitochondrial function, and we will need angiogenesis. We will need new blood vessels that can take all of the good stuff that we need in order to repair, in order to build. And we will go with it one by one. Start with the trigger. The most powerful trigger that we have in our body the trigger regenerative, the trigger rebuild, the trigger repair, is actually hypoxia. And when we're speaking about hypoxia, we have the HIF. HIF stands for hypoxic-induced factor. Hypoxic-induced factor is 
a promoter. Once it's going up, there will be a lot of genes that will start to express themselves. And why is that? Because if we have hypoxia, the body knows that there is a problem. So if he sends hypoxia, he will trigger everything that is needed. Stem cells, new blood vessel, changing mitochondria, and that's the HIF. Okay, that's hypoxic induced factor. The free Nobel Prize winner over that HIF from two years ago. So if I want to trigger the repair mechanism, all I have to do is to take a person, hold his breath, stop his heartbeat, and then I will have the HIF. There is only one problem with regard to that. <laughs> you will really need it. And, and we were thinking what the body actually sends. Does the body sense the absolute values or does the body sense the fluctuation? There is no absolute in anything. Everything is relative. I will feel that I'm fortunate or unfortunate, not based on the, of the absolute value that I have. It's usually based on what my neighbor has. That's why I don't want to move from the place that we are living, okay? The place that we are living, my daughters are very happy, so I'm staying here, okay? Uh, so everything, everything is relative. So we were thinking, what will happen if we will generate this fluctuation from very high back to the normal? And this is what we call the hyperoxic epoxic paradox. The idea is that you take somebody, you are increasing the oxygen to very high level, and then doing a fast decline back to the normal. If you do it right, this decline from very high back to the normal will be interpreted like lack of oxygen, even though we don't have this lack of oxygen. To optimize this, what I'm telling you now, it's only five years of research. How much time, how high, how low do we take? Oxygen is a drug. So it's not that I can come to a person and tell him, I want you to take three pills of oxygen per day. I can say that, but, but it's, not, it's, not, it's not gonna happen. So since it's a drug, we need to compress more molecules of oxygen per square to our mouth, to our respiratory system, from there to the circulation and to all over the body. For that, we are using those suites. This is, by the way, uh, the Aviv clinic that you have in Florida that Woody mentioned before. That's how it looks. People are going inside. We are compressing the chamber with air, not with the oxygen. And then you get the oxygen by the mask. By doing that, we can only ask the patient to take the mask off. And when they are taking the mask off, the oxygen is declining from very high back to the normal. And then we can do this re-stimulation. If we are in the chamber at two atmospheres with 100% oxygen with the mask, we are increasing the blood oxygenation from 100 mercuries to 1600. At 1600, mercuries of oxygen, the dissolved oxygen in the blood is sufficient for all the energy demand. We don't need the red blood cells. And then all you have to do is ask the person to take the mask off. The oxygen is declining from 1600 back to the normal range. And this decline is being interpreted as hypoxia. You do it repeatedly, and that's how we generate what we call the hyperoxic epoxic paradox. As an example, this is cell cultures. You're taking cell cultures. You measure the HIF in the medium. You are increasing the oxygen to very high. You can see that the HIF is going to zero. And then you are going back to the same level of oxygen as before. But you can see that afterwards, the HIF is increasing. Even though you are at the same level of oxygen, if is significantly higher. Why? Because of the paradox. We are treating the cell to think that he's lacking oxygen, even though you have extra oxygen or the same oxygen as before. This is at the tissue level. We are very interesting. I think that what we have here between our ears is very important. We call it the brain. It's a tissue. And we can demonstrate that the same procedure also stimulates HIF in the brain. This is people that are coming to our treatment, normal aging individual, 
come in daily and you can see that after 30 sessions, 60 sessions, actually the outside environment where we are now is being interpreted as epoxic environment even though we don't have epoxia. But it has to be done repeatedly. So we are gaining benefit from all the epoxic related mechanism without the epoxia. So we have the trigger. The other thing is the stem cells. I am sure that everybody in this room know what stem cells is. If I need to simplify it to people, I always say, you know, this machine was built not for a day or two. Whoever created this machine, he or she, doesn't matter. Okay, generated this machine not for a day or two, for a period of time. So whoever generated us knew that things will get wrong. The only thing he didn't know is what will get wrong. So instead of giving us repair, he gave us the three-dimensional printer. He said, print. If you have a problem with the skin, print the skin. If the bone, print the bone, whatever it is. These are the stem cells. And actually, this body that stands in front of you was built up from one, one omnipotent cells, gathered from two, that was replicated to all of this. So these are the stem cells. Working with stem cells in our lab, we are working a lot of stem cells. I can tell you that I'm an excellent physician of mice and rats. I can cure everything in rats and mice. Everything. Give me the disease, I will cure it. So when we are injecting stem cells into mice, the results are unbelievable. However, when we are moving to people, at least in our hands, the results are not so meaningful. Okay? There are some anti-inflammatory effects at the injection days, but but that's it. And we were thinking, why is that? Why, why the mice are so good and we are not? Okay? You can look at the mice, you can look at us, it's a bit different. When I will have time, I will write, I will write a book, We Are Not Mice. On the cover, there will be a human being and a small mice, okay? But this is, this is how we do research. One of the problems that we think is that when we are taking stem cells out, we replicate and inject, we think that what we are injecting is the same thing. But we don't even know what to measure. In the parameter that we are measuring, it's the same. But there are so many parameters that we don't know that we need to measure. So this is one thing. The other thing is that it's a single injection. If we have an injury, it's not a single injection. There is a continuous flow of, of stem cells that can repair that. It's not a single injection. And the last thing is that usually, if we have a place that is not being recovered, there are some bottleneck that prevent this tissue from being recovered. And that can be related to blood flow, that can be related to infection, that can be related to many other stuff. However, when we are working on mice, we are doing a trigger to cause the damage, but then we take the trigger out. So it's a different, it's a different scenario. With regard to the stem cells, the same thing, going up and down, the hyperoxic epoxic paradox. You can see people that are coming to consequence treatment. You can see that after 30 sessions, 60 sessions, actually after 30 sessions, the amount of stem cell that is flying all over is just like the amount of stem cell that usually at the age of 18, 15, that's what it is, but then you need to keep it up. But it has to be at least 30 sessions. And even if you take the stem cells up, you need to keep them up. You cannot just stop. Okay? You need the repairs. Nobody expects a wound to be in repaired in one day. The same here. We spoke about the supporting environment. And you can look at the stem cells themselves as, as this plant. If you will take the best plant in the world, and you will put it on, on the right side on the screen, what will happen? Probably not much. However, if you will put it on the right side, on the flourish land, it will grow, it will flourish, it will be amazing. Usually in our body, in most cases, we have a problem with the land. Okay? You can see a blood flow, potent blood flow. It's flowing, there is a good oxygen supply. On the right side, you can see what happened to most of us when we age, as an example, is occlusion of the small blood vessels, the choroiza that we have in the pipe. We call it a pterosclerosis process. 
So if we have this occlusion, whatever comes after this occlusion over here, this is a desert. You can take the best plant in the world, put it here, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. So even if you, if you take the best stem cells, put it here, probably nothing will happen. At least it doesn't happen in our hand. However, if we are taking this place, this narrowing, into hyperoxygenized environment, the amount of the dissolve, dissolve oxygen is so high that it can go by diffusion even to the desert. So this is not a desert anymore, and now you can implant. Is that point clear? I always tell my students, there's not a bad student, there is a terrible teacher, so feel free to ask, okay? It's on me. The last thing that we need is angiogenesis, access road. If we want to build something, we need access, otherwise it will not happen, okay? The access road in our body, these are the blood vessels. So people cannot live in the chamber. We need to generate blood vessels. We call this process angiogenesis, generation of new blood vessels. Can it happen? Yes, it can. We can all see it. If we are in, going to the gym, we are doing some exercise, you can suddenly see new blood vessels generated. What do we need for angiogenesis? We need a trigger. We have it. The fluctuations. We need the energy. We have it. We have the oxygen. And... We need the stem cells that can generate this blood flow, so we have it. So we can see generation of new blood vessels. We can see it in the brain. If we want to look directly at the brain for doing that, we need, we need tissue. For that, we are using mice and rats. By the way, every new year, I'm trying to get permission to get some brain tissue access in human beings, okay? So every year on, on January, celebrating the new year, I have new Helsinki application. Last year I applied for uh, lawyers. I said, I want to take biopsy. They said, no human. I said, okay, lawyers. And this year I applied for politician. <laughs> okay? <laughs> didn't work, didn't work. But I will try again, if you have some idea. I said, no human. I said, no, no, this is politicians. Okay? So, so here we can see the blood vessels directly. However, in humans, since we don't have access yet, we are using perfusion MRI where we can see the perfusion. So this is, in the upper row, you can see the cerebral blood flow. You can see before, you can see after. That's the way I like it. You don't need to explain. You just see and understand. And here you can see the cerebral blood volume, again, before and after. And for the first time, we see in humans angiogenesis, generation of new blood vessels in the brain. So we have the trigger, we have the stem cells, we have the energy, we have what we need, almost. We need the engine. The engine is the mitochondria. So I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the mitochondria, but what we tend to forget is what is the environment where the mitochondria is actually living. And that's very important because if we're speaking about 100 mercuries of oxygen in the blood, the mitochondria is actually exposed to one to four mercuries of oxygen. That's it, not more than that. And if we are increasing our hemoglobin, we are not necessarily increasing the amount of oxygen that the mitochondria is sensing because the hemoglobin is binding the oxygen. It doesn't play, the binded oxygen to the, to the red blood cells doesn't play with the diffusion gradient. I'm also a nephrologist, okay? I think that I'm the only professor in the neuroscience school who is also a nephrologist, okay? For me, it doesn't matter. The brain, the kidneys, wounds, it's just a tissue, okay? And the same elements are needed for all. So what's good in nephrology is that the patient don't have kidneys. This is great. <laughs> Why is so great? Because you take full control of all the biology. You can control everything, okay? The sodium, the potassium, everything, but also the hemoglobin. And since the dialysis patients are dying from cardiovascular disease, they're actually dying from hypoxia, we were thinking, okay, okay, let's solve that. 
we can increase the hemoglobin. Instead of having 12, we will have 16, 18, 20, whatever we want, we will increase the oxygen delivery. And we give more erythropoietin. So we did several clinical studies on that. What happened? The opposite. The patient died more. If we are increasing the hemoglobin above 12, it's not only that we are not improving, they are dying more. Why? Because we are increasing the viscosity in the blood. However, the oxygen gradients stays the same. So we don't have any effect on the oxygen gradient. And that's very important to understand because the end organ to this oxygen, it's the mitochondria. And by increasing the hemoglobin, we are not getting there. Clear? So when we are doing those fluctuation of oxygen up and down, up and down by a simple measure like taking the mask off, we are actually doing exercise training to the mitochondria, okay? Intermittent exercise to the mitochondria, up and down. And then we can see that we can have an amazing thing. We have mitochondrial proliferation and more activity of the mitochondria that we have, usually in complex one. And we can see quite easily, this is the mitochondria in the muscles. And surprisingly, we see the same effect in the mitochondria in the brain. Surprise, surprise, the brain is a tissue. And the same changes that we have in the muscle, like the previous lecture that we have, we have it also in the brain. So this is animal models, and we did a study in humans. We took athletes, aging athletes like me, okay? And we did muscle biopsies. And then you take them into the, what we call the hyperoxic epoxic paradox, up and down, up and down. And we can take the, do the biopsy, we can isolate the mitochondria, and we can evaluate actually each of the mitochondria complex and see the activity. And we can see the increased activity of complex one, and we can see that we gain more ATP per oxygen molecule with less contamination, which we call radicals, okay, that is going outside. So we can actually have more activity per mitochondria. The mitochondria is more powerful. And we can see also mitochondrial proliferation. The mitochondria are changing all the time. It's, it's a living creature within us, okay? So you, they can replicate, they can migrate, it's, it's amazing. I wish it was this kind of test were accessible by blood samples, not only by biopsy, but, but that's what we have. So let's see, what is the tool that we have? So we spoke about the hyperoxic epoxic paradox. We can trigger the repair mechanism, we can trigger the stem cells, we have more energy. And we ask ourselves, okay, so, so how do we do that? As we said before, what is the clinical practice today? The clinical practice today is we are waiting for the crash to come. And when we have the crash, we say, okay, you need to go to the garage. But there are some accidents that it's totally lost. And not always we can help. But still in the daily clinical practice as physician, we are targeting the wound, targeting the damage. And what's important to understand, and I will emphasize it again, this is Michal Schwartz, our colleagues from the Weizmann Institute. I hope she will get a Nobel Prize, and no Nobel Prize for what? For demonstrating that the brain is a tissue. And just like any other tissue in our body, the basic elements that needed to repair the wound, the peripheral wounds, are the basic elements needed to repair the wound in the brain. Of course, that in the wound in the brain, we will have glial cells, and in the peripheral wounds, we will have fibroblasts, but it's the same thing. With regard to the clinical practice being done today, we will wait for peripheral wound, and then we can repair it with the hyperoxic epoxic paradox. We can look at wounds in the brain, classical wounds, for example, radiation injury. Okay, I have just been asked by a colleague 
who lives here in the U.S. He had radiation injury in the brain, and he's saying, my, my physician told me that the brain is not a tissue. Okay, so whatever elements that you are dealing there is, is not good for the brain, which is nice, but look at this. This is, you can see the clear wounds, and you can see how this wound is being, being repaired. When we started to walk with the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox, we said, okay, we will start with classical wounds in the brain. The classical wound is, is a stroke. What's good in stroke? You have acute insult. After this insult, you have several degrees of damage to the brain. You have necrosis. Necrosis, it means that the tissue is totally dead. And the tissue is being replaced with fluids. So we don't have the infrastructure on which the stem cells can reach and replicate. As we know, we have stem cells in the brain. The stem cells are located in the hippocampus. They replicate and migrate. It's a process that happens all the time. Actually, the brain that speaks with you now was not in medical school. It's a new brain. Okay? This is mind-blowing. <laughs> okay? Never give up on a person. Come to him six months after and say, now you're a new brain, let's, let's discuss from the beginning what's going on. Okay? But this is what happened. But still, if we are triggering these stem cells to replicate and move, if you don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the land, it will not grow yet. I'm saying yet because we are working on new stuff. We can take cells from the abdomen, do reverse engineering, make them stem cells, make them then neurons, create a patch, and put the patch. Again, we are very good in mice. You remember the mice from the previous? Uh, same mice, we are doing very good. In humans, not yet. Post-concussion syndrome. Post-concussion syndrome is something that we tend to ignore. There is severe injury to the brain, which can be traumatic brain injury. And actually, what's, what's being done today, we categorize the patients not based on what we see in the brain, based on the time that they were unconscious. If it's half an hour or less, we call it mild. If it's up to one day, we can call it moderate. If it's more than one day, we can call it severe. Not so smart. We need to look at the brain and see what's going on. So when we are speaking about concussion or blast injury, that unfortunately now we have quite of it in Israel, okay, we are speaking about, let's say I'm driving a car, I have a clash, then the head is moving like this. In the brain, we have two layers. We have the cortex and we have the medulla. The density of these two layers is different. And since the density and the mass is different, if we have force on different mass, then the acceleration will be different. And this will move in this kind of way. And small in between can tear down. When this is happening, then we have a tissue that's suffering from relative ischemia that will not heal unless we will open that bottleneck. The main problem, we don't see it in standard MRI or standard CT. And then this patient will approach the physician. They will tell the physician, you know, my concentration is not so good, my ability to the information processing speed, okay? My mental status, surprisingly located, in certain area of the brain is not good as it used to be, the physician will send them to MRI, see that is normal, and instead of saying, we, physician, instead of telling the patient that we are not smart enough to know what he have, we are saying, you don't have anything, it's all normal. Okay? Don't say normal, it's not normal. Say, I don't know how to see your problem. I'm not good enough, I need to be better. In order to see the damage, we need to move to a different resolution. We need to do metabolic imaging of the brain. And this is a colleague of mine from the university. She's a lecturer in the university. She had an accident. Okay, what was the accident? She went down the bus and fell down. She lost consciousness for five minutes, not more than that. And everything was changed afterwards. Okay, she, it was hard to, to give lectures. It was hard to, hard to read. She had some mental issues, started with the psychiatric medication, and you know, you know the standard cascade that happened after this event. And she came to us, and then we are doing this brain imaging. 
This is a brain imaging. We are not using FDG, which is glucose. We are using another material. We call it ECD. ECD has been metabolized in the mitochondria of the neurons. It penetrates the cell membrane. It's lipophilic, so it's penetrating. It will be metabolized and then become hydrophilic. Then it's stuck. You mark it with the marker, and then you can translate the signal into a picture so we can understand it. Okay? We are I mean physicians, we are not so smart, we need to see it in a simple way. So look over here. This you see from the below. This is the orbit of frontal, B temporal, green. It means that the area is not active, but you have the infrastructure. Red is fully active, and you can see this area that are non-functioning before and after. Just the wound. That's what that's what it is. And of course, the cognitive improvement will follow. And if you want to treat something, you need to know what you are treating. So everybody who is going into our treatment is only after we see that there is a wound that we can treat. There are some wounds that we can not treat. I will continue with the next step, which is age-related cognitive decline with Alzheimer and after the first talk that we had the privilege to listen, we all understand that amyloid is not probably the primary cause. It's probably a marker. And if we are doing studies on animals, again, going back to the mice model of Alzheimer, we can see the amyloid plaque without treatment and here with the treatment. Not because we are targeting the amyloid plaque, we are not doing anything related to that. It's because of the fluctuation that we generate. We have no more blood vessels, we have better metabolism, we have reduced inflammation. And as a side effect, only side effect, the amyloid plaque disappear. Is that point clear? And here is another thing. This is neurogenesis in the brain. We can see that the neurons are being stimulated and we have more neurons in the brain, again in, again in mice. With regard to humans, the data that we have so far that was published was on mild cognitive impairment, earlier stage. When we look at the brain, you can see this kind of brain. If it's a standard MRI, we can see the, the, the ischemic lesions that are spreading all over, which we call normal for age, which is ridiculous, this, this kind of thing. Nobody wants to be according to his age. If somebody will come to me and said, you are normal to your age, I said, no way. You will be normal to your age. I want to be my best, okay? But that's what we see in the MRI. And if we are adding the perfusion MRI, then we can understand better what is going on. See, this is before treatment. You can see the malperfusion, which is all over. And look what happened after the treatment. The anatomy looks the same, but this is a totally different activity of the brain. And of course, as a side effect, the cognitive function are improving. Not because we are doing some cognitive training, because the core mechanism of the tissue was changed. Some of you know that we have done probably one of the most comprehensive studies ever done on normal aging population. What do you mean by normal aging? We are taking people the age of 65 years or older, no diabetes, no obese, fully active, fully function, okay? No stroke, us. And then we randomize them into two groups and we measure almost everything that we can. With regard to the brain, what you can see over here, this is the cognitive function. You can see the global, the memory, uh, attention, information processing speed. The green is the control group. The blue is the intervention group. And you can see that it's not slowing the decline. It's improving the cognitive function. Why does it happen? It happens because we have the neuroplasticity in the brain. We have more blood vessels, we have more neurons, and that's, of course, being reflected in the cognitive function. Surprisingly, and this will soon be published, this is, we did also cardiac MRI. And cardiac MRI with perfusion of the myocardium. And you can see, surprisingly, that once the stem cells are going up, when the 
blood vessels are being generated, it's not only in the brain, it happens also in the heart. You can see baseline without treatment, how it's going down, and then you get the treatment is increase in myocardium blood flow. That's been reflected with a better VO2 max test, anaerobic threshold, VO2 max, the amount of exercise that you are able to do. Another tissue is the penis, okay? Erection is blood flow. And again, the same thing. So we have penis MRI with perfusion. You can see before treatment, no perfusion. With the treatment, you can see the increase in the perfusion. Why? Because the same thing happened all over. Now I want to get, since we have a bit more time, about other diseases that we as physicians find it hard to handle, but I'm sure that the people in that conference are facing that on, on a daily basis. One of them is fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is a syndrome where people have generalized pain. However, when we are looking at the location where the pain is, we don't see anything. And as physicians, we say to these people, you don't have anything, but it's a horrible disease. And if you want to understand what the disease is, look at Frida Kahlo, self-portrait. It happens to be that she had fibromyalgia. Just look at the portrait and you can understand what fibromyalgia is. No need to speak. Today we understand that the problem in fibromyalgia is in the brain, certain area in the brain that are responsible for the interpretation of the signals that are coming from the body. If the signal that is coming to the brain is being malinterpreted, then we reflect that as pain, even though we don't have anything that jeopardizes the pain location. We don't have a problem over there. It's with the interpretation. It's just like there will be here a fire alarm, but there is no fire. The alarm is still annoying, but the alarm is real. And in the ongoing clinical studies that we do, we can mark this area. We still don't diagnose fibromyalgia based on the brain imaging, but we can see the fingerprint of fibromyalgia. And once we treat that and when we repair the wound, then the symptoms improve. Today, we understand that fibromyalgia is related to the brain, a certain area. There can be different triggers. It can be traumatic brain injury, mechanical injury. This area where injured, the reflection will be fibromyalgia. It can be certain type of infection. In a minute, we will say a word or two about COVID. Okay, when we have the virus damaging certain area in the brain, we may have fibromyalgia, EBV, CMV. It can be also severe emotional stress. Okay, severe emotional stress can cause damage to the brain that is not less, and in many times it's even more severe than just mechanical injury. When we started the fibromyalgia program, we had patients that came with fibromyalgia that is being induced by child abuse. Today we are not doing a study on fibromyalgia, just fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia because of what? So we have studies that were published and soon additional will publish on child sexual abuse related fibromyalgia. I can let you see the brain imaging and the changes, but instead of that, I have a, a very, very good colleague, Professor, Professor Achelev. She's considered to be one of the leaders in, in child abuse. And when we initiate that study, I consulted her and she told me, please Shai, I want you to do one thing in that study. I said, what? Let the patient pain themselves. I said, really? Really? I'm doing functional MRI, I'm doing DTI, we will do SPECT scan. What do you mean self-portrait? What do you mean painting? I said, I'm asking you, if you can, please do that. I said, I, I was polite, I said, yes. Now look at this picture. This is 53-year-old woman who had child sexual abuse. Look on the left how she paint herself at the beginning before starting the treatment. No need to speak. The second is during the treatment. 
And look how she bent herself at the end of the treatment. You don't need to speak much. Okay? By the way, she hasn't been paint, painting anything in the past. This is the first time she's painting something. Look at another example. You can see how this is another 32 years old lady. See how she paint herself at the beginning? Along the treatment. This is very symbolic. And this is how she paint herself at the end of the treatment. By the way, a lot of repressed memory or unaccessible memories can ramp up during the treatment. So this is one thing. Based on this, we have done a study on PTSD. Now, you know that in Israel, everybody is going to the military. And I'm an officer. I'm a paratrooper. So I used to serve. Now I'm too old. And my perspective on PTSD was totally different than what I am now. And I will give you an example. When I have two of my soldiers develop PTSD in the battlefield in the second Lebanon too, I came to them and I said, what the fuck? You're moving your hands, you're moving your legs, we need to go to the next mission. Okay, so we lost some of our guys, but we have a mission, we need to go. I said, I, and they told me, I, we cannot do it. I said, what do you mean? And in the past, everybody who spoke with me about PTSD, I used to tell them, you know, this is my wife. She's a social worker. I'm dealing with physiology. This is not it. But along the years, I have started to notice that I might be mistaken. And when I noticed that I might be mistaken, I said, okay, I might be mistaken. Let's challenge ourselves. And for doing that, we have developed a rat model of PTSD. Said, I need to do a model, I will see, maybe I'm mistaken. So how do you generate a PTSD to a rat? You take the rat, you put him in a cage with the urine of a cat for one hour. You don't touch the rat. One hour with the urine of a cat, he cannot escape. And then three months afterwards, you are taking the brain up. I was looking at the microscope and I see a wound. I said, oh my God, this is a real biological injury. And asking somebody with PTSD to behave normally in the daily routine is just like asking somebody with a broken leg to run. He wants to do it. He just cannot. And here you can see the actual wound. And when we saw that wound, I said, okay, it's a wound. What do we need to repair a wound? <laughs> We need a trigger, we need the stem cells, we need the angiogenesis, we need to change the metabolism, and that's what it is. So we have an ongoing research program that is running a couple of years, but see the functional MRI. This is the functional MRI on the left side of a normal, healthy individual, where you see the lights, they get some, some task to do, and when you see the lights, you can see the activity, and on the right side, you can see a PTSD patient. It's not working. It's not working. As simple as that. It's a wound. And, and you know, I gave, I gave a talk at, to my colleague, the psychiatrics, and I let them see a wound in the leg. And they saw the wound in the leg, and I asked them, would somebody of you will speak with that wound and ask him to heal? And this wound will heal? They will look at me in a ridiculous way, and then I let them see that wound. I said, why do you speak with that wound? So of course we need the psychological support, but, but first we need to repair the broken leg. Then you can train him to run again, to get back to normal life, but, but you need to repair that wound. We have done that, we have finished another study, and today in Israel, any soldier that is suffering from treatment-resistant PTSD is coming to us. We are looking at the imaging. If we see the wound, we just repair the wound and he can continue from there. Take, it, take this tissue to wherever you want. And here you can see before treatment on the left side, after treatment, again, that's the way I like it, no discussion. This is before, this is after. It just looks like we're doing an x-ray to a broken leg. It's broken, it's fixed, go, move, next. I would like to say a couple of words with the time that we have on post-COVID or long-COVID or whatever you want to call it. Almost 
four years ago, we, when I'm saying we, I'm speaking about Homo sapiens who lives on this planet, we were facing a huge challenge, a new virus that was unknown, that was killing people, and everybody were called on duty, including me and my research team. We were called on duty. Shai, Lee, whatever you are doing, now we need you and your staff and the research facility that you have in order to investigate post-COVID. Okay. So we were, we were one of the first to evaluate which antibodies are going up, when they're going up, when they're going down, the duration, when do we need to give additional vaccination, et cetera, et cetera. In, in all of this, in the first study that we have done, we have follow up the patient because we want to see how, how the immune system, for how long the immune system is memorizing the exposure to the virus. And in this study, the patient were invited to, to a follow-up six months after, eight months after, one year after. And then we have noticed something weird. People, young people, otherwise healthy, complain about brain fog, fatigue, inability to concentrate, answering 10 emails per day instead of 50 emails per day, feeling less, less active, they needed to sleep suddenly during the day. And when we started to see that, I said, oh my God, there's something going on. I said, there is something. It's long COVID, it's post COVID, there wasn't definition by then. There is a problem over here, we need to investigate that. Of course, my colleague told me, oh, Shai, you are stupid again, you are making sense again. Hey, you know, we are on lockdown, everybody is afraid, that's all emotional. I said, might be, but we want to investigate that. And today, this is what we call long COVID, there is definition, the WHO definition. Unfortunately, since COVID, is not so sexy anymore and not in the news anymore, then we, when I'm saying we, I'm speaking about the medical society, are quite ignoring that. It's become less sexy going to the physician and saying them that. I just got a call from a colleague in the university, another professor, who was calling me and said, Shai, I need your help. I said, okay, you got it. What do you need? He said, I'm suffering from what seems like long COVID. I went to my GP and discuss it with him. And he said, oh, the COVID is not in the news anymore. It's not relevant to behave yourself, okay? <laughs> and I said, come, let's see what you have. So with regard to long COVID, I think that there, there can be many things related to that, but we were focusing on, on the cognitive side. And to make a long story short, what do we know today? We know today that the virus can penetrate the brain. It can penetrate here through the cribriform plate. Once the virus is penetrating, it can bind to the neuronal cells, inject the genetic material, that the genetic material can also go to the mitochondria of the neurons. And this neuron is not active as it used to be in the past. The other thing, the penetrating virus can bind to the glia cells, which has ACE2 receptor on them can bind to the ACE2 receptor, cause gliosis, inflammation of the glial cells. Another way of penetrating is through the bloodstream. It can penetrate the bloodstream and again bind to the ACE2 receptor that we have on the blood vessels. And then we have micro infarcts in the brain. And then we have a kind of aging brain in a relatively young individual who is aging fast or much faster way. And here what you see, this is, this is the cribriform plate. This is a neuronal tissue, and, and around in it, in, gray, in red, you can see the virus. You can see how the virus is penetrating here through the cribriform plate. You can see how the virus can bind to the neuronal cells, inject the genetic material into the neurons, and then these neurons will not function in the way it used to be in the past. And you can see the microinfarct that can generate in the brain. And the severity of the long COVID or the chance to have long COVID is not necessarily related to the severity of the primary disease. It's just bad luck. 
just bad luck. Who we'll have it and who we'll not? And we, in that study, in addition to definition of long COVID, what we did, we took patients with long COVID, we randomized them into two groups, treatment group, placebo group. I was thinking that both groups will improve because, you know, like a flu, we were thinking at the beginning it, it will improve. And we see a significant improvement in the treatment group. However, the control group, zip, zero. It's not improving. People are getting adjusted to their new limitation, but adjusting to the limitation, adjusting in answering less email per day, adjusting in sleeping during the day, going to sleep earlier or not sleeping at all, but it's adjustment, it's not improvement. So when you are doing the test, it's not improving. With the treatment, we are, you know, we are treating with wounds. We saw the wounds, we treat the wounds, and we can see the different areas in the brain that are improving. It's very exciting for us because we can learn a lot from it. Some of the long COVID patients may have problem in the limbic system, and then they will develop PTSD-like symptom, but without the PTSD. So that's, we prove the, the biological core of, of what we call PTSD. We can look at the network and see how these networks are being functioned. We can see before, we can see after, and we can learn a lot from these studies about the functionality in the brain and not only by improving the brain. Many, many of the long COVID patients will describe that they cannot have the physical capacity that they had in the past. Something like 3% of the professional athletes have retired because they cannot perform in the same way before the COVID. One of the reasons is the cardiac function. So if you are doing standard echocardiograph, you will not see anything. However, if you are doing a better functioning evaluation of the contractility of the heart, the synchronization of the contractility, then you will see that it's been damaged. And with the treatment again, because you are increasing the stem cells, it's not in a certain location, it's all over, we can see the improvement also with regard to that. So what do we have? We have a tool, we call it the hyperoxic epoxic paradox, meaning by generating a fluctuation in pressure and oxygen, it has to be the exact fluctuation that we generate. All the rest, it's not it. We can induce the trigger, we can induce the stem cells proliferation, and we can induce the mitochondrial proliferation and everything related to it. That's the tool that we have. We can use it to repair a tissue. And by saying repairing a tissue, of course, in medicine, we separate the physician. There is a brain physician, there is a heart physician, there is a leg physician. But the core elements are the same. The core elements that we need to repair are the same. And those are the core elements that, that we need. I must emphasize again, there is a song that's saying, if you want to do it, do it right, okay? Do it right. And, and the protocol that we use, the protocol that were proved to be effective are being done in that way, in those chamber, those kind of protocol. That's how you generate the hyperoxic epoxic paradox. Unfortunately, all of this tube or sacks full of air that are claiming that the research that we and other dance is also effective, but this one might be true, but, but it's not been investigated. More than that, the quality assurance is of significantly important. You cannot take a generator that is hiding over here and take the air that is going out of the generator into this tube and ask people to breathe it. You need a good quality assurance to make sure that what our patients are breathing is exactly what we define that they should do it. So it's highly important to do it in that way. And if we will all do it in that way, we can do a lot of good to so many people. But we need to do it right. So that's the end of what I have to say. Thank you very much. And maybe we have a time for a question or two.